This is the current federal tax developments for the week of May the 9th, 2022. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers presenting here from Phoenix, Arizona, and we'll talk about some of the stuff that went on this week in the area of federal taxes. And one of the key things we're going to look at this week, well, we have our first inflation adjustment number for 2023. And this one always comes out the earliest. Uh, we'll talk about what it is, of course, the health savings account numbers. Uh, also quickly discuss when we expect other inflation adjusted numbers to come out. But I wouldn't be waiting by the computer for a notice from the IRS about getting those inflation adjusted numbers for 23. The rest of them are going to wait on anytime soon. I would say you have until about Halloween for the next set to come out. We'll also talk about an issue. Uh, this particular private lettering we're going to discuss is not really that unusual. In fact, I see them all the time. We want to discuss why they keep happening and what the issue is. And the problem in this case is going to be that the failure of trustees of a trust that received S corporation shares from a decedent failed to actually execute the plan that was in the estate plan and that was in their trust document. And that ended up costing the S corporation the need to go get a private letter ruling. And we'll discuss why you often need that ruling as well as the problems we have and why S corps are so super fragile. Finally, we'll talk about a case that actually settled an issue that wasn't totally clear about whether or not the IRS office that normally rules on whether a case qualifies for innocent spouse release, why that office will not get the final call, the tax court determined, if the issue first arises as part of an affirmative defense in a tax court deficiency proceeding. That's true, even though in this particular case, the potentially innocent spouse actually had no idea that there was an issue until after the tax court case got well along and she discovered that her, I guess, ex-spouse at this point had not really notified her about the fact that there was an exam ongoing. Uh, and it was kind of an interesting set of facts. Um, despite that sort of discussion, we'll discover that it wasn't that her ex was uh, keeping her in the dark so she couldn't raise his spouse defense. In fact, he actually raised it, unfortunately, without telling her that he was doing this. Uh, but it still was interesting that despite all of that, she didn't get the actual ability to use this particular IRS office to determine initially if the IRS was going to give her innocent spouse relief or not. As we'll discuss, the case comes down to the fact that even though this office recommended that she get innocent spouse relief, uh, the chief counsel wanted more information, and the tax court ruled that as a matter of law, if it's in this fashion in litigation, the tax, in essence, the chief counsel's office gets final say for the IRS position, not this administrative office. And we'll discuss a little bit about how that happens, why it happens, and the like. But with that, let's start with Revenue Procedure 2022-24, issued on April the 29th. As you may be aware, a lot of things in the tax law are subject to inflation adjustments. Uh, that was a system that became very popular in the 80s. The 86 Tax Act had a big chunk of it. I found it interesting that it became popular just as the basically high inflation, much high, very high inflation of the late 70s and early 80s was receding but it came into play. We've got that now that inflation is picking up again, um, although not yet to the late 70s, early 80s levels, and we are certainly hope we don't get there. But, you know, now we're going to go back to talk about the inflation adjustment rules, why they apply, and the order we tend to get these numbers out of the IRS. In this case, though, we're looking at the limits for health savings accounts. And so these are the HSA numbers. Now, quick review of health savings accounts. A health savings account was established a number of years ago as a way for taxpayers, 
to put pre-tax money aside that could be used to pay for medical expenses. And if used for that purpose, uh, essentially, you never pay tax on these amounts. So it's a way of getting medical deductions effectively above the line by pre-funding the medical expenses using the health savings account. The catch, as we discovered remember, a number of years ago, we ended up getting this, the limitations we had where you had to get to higher and higher levels of adjusted gross income, a percentage over that in order to get any benefit from medical deductions, plus you need to be able to itemize, and that is also now a bigger problem for people. So HSAs were a way, even if you otherwise couldn't itemize or you're not going to have expenses that are going to clear 7.5% of your income, you could effectively still get a benefit for medical. The theory of the program initially, the uh, economic justification for it was that by doing this, people would negotiate uh, health care costs with their provider. And by doing that, it would lower the inflation on health care. Not sure that's really worked. Um, I don't see many people sitting there haggling in doctor's offices over what the cost will be. Uh, it just kind of they pay whatever it is, whatever their insurance carrier approves, they end up paying. But nevertheless, it's still there. Now, in order to have a health savings account, though, there are two rules. Because the whole concept of this was to get people to negotiate, the idea was we would put these funds aside, but we didn't want you to put these funds aside and then have an insurance policy that covered most every expense. We wanted this to be a quote unquote high deductible situation where most medical expenses were had to be paid out of pocket by the insured, therefore giving the incentive for the insured to negotiate the best deal with the physician's office. So because of that, you cannot have anything but qualifying coverage. You have to have a qualifying high deductible health plan in order to be able to make this health savings account contribution, and you cannot have any disqualifying coverage. If you have other coverage, that's it. You can't do this. Okay, now here are the numbers that are being modified for 2023. The first thing is how much money can you put back? If you are in a self-only health savings, highly deductible health plan, and a self-only plan is one that, quite of as it says, covers exactly one person, right? It doesn't cover any children, dependents, spouses, etc. It covers just that person. If you're in that situation, the maximum contribution for 2023 will be $3,850. If your coverage covers any other people, right, your spouse, your dependent, right, You've got any of that coverage, spouse or dependent coverage, and it can be, doesn't care how many how many people are covered, you know, hopefully one spouse, but preferably, but you could have multiple children, no children, it doesn't matter. If you have the coverage, then your maximum contribution is $7,750 to the health savings accounts. That's a tax-free account that grows tax-free. There is a penalty if you use the money uh, you take the money out and use it for non-medical purposes until you reach age 65, after which it can come out just like an additional retirement fund. That, that was the concept behind it. Now, the high deductible health plans also have amounts set. Again, there is going to have to be a minimum deductible since that was the whole point of this thing, right? How much? We're not going to let you have a $100 deductible. Rather, for a self-only policy, the deductible must be at least $1,500 for self-only. And for family coverage, the overall deductible for the family, and this is what's important here, is you're, you're not going to split this up, $1,500 for one spouse, $1,500 for the other. It's going to be $3,000 for both spouses and any dependent, any kids that are also in the mix. That $3,000 family total. The plan has to require that. Now, there are some exceptions, especially for certain preventive care. Uh, so certain things are there. So that's why you'll see that when you go, for instance, you go in to get a lot of vaccinations, there's no charge. You get an annual physical generally at no charge. Concept is that that would help control inflation because it, 
keeps down demand for medical services because people aren't just waiting until they get sick. That's the concept there. The other thing a high-level health plan has to have is there is a max out-of-pocket. That is $7,500 for a self-only policy. So your maximum out-of-pocket, the amount you're going to pay, assuming you stay in network, they are allowed to to you know, they are allowed to say these limits don't count once you get out of network. It would be seventy five hundred for self only, fifteen thousand for family. Now again, these all begin in twenty twenty three, right? They're they're not what you see now. So we have that. As well, there is another thing that's now in there. The regulations gave us this: the accepted benefit health savings account, or basically, yeah, I should say. Health reimbursement arrangement, accepted benefit HRAs can have a maximum amount put into them of 1950. That is one type of deemed qualifying coverage if you have an accepted benefit HRA. Uh, they were created a couple of years ago under regulation 54.9831-1C38 is where you're going to find those referenced. Now, the other inflation items we expect to see. Generally, in late October, and quite often right around Halloween, uh, we should get a pair of them come out in October. One will be the limitations for qualified plans and other employee benefits. So those numbers come out then. Also, we see around the same time the major package of inflation adjustments for income tax items for things like adjusting the brackets, you know, adjusting various things like uh adoption credits, the amounts for the unified credit for uh, estate and gift taxes, all of those things are in a huge package that comes out every year with new inflation adjustments. The final one we tend to get, the final major one, uh, is the quote we tend to refer to as the luxury auto rules limitations. And those always actually tend to tend to wait into the following years. So that one could be sometime in 23, and that's varied in recent years. It can come very early. It can come very late in the year. But that's usually the final one we get. So we've got our first one. Don't worry about the others until October. And a lot of this has to do with when they pull the consumer price index in order to do the computations. And this one is the earliest date they pull the consumer price index. They'll pull the CPI later for the other adjustments. So they'll come up at a later time. Next up, we're going to talk about a situation. And as I said, if you actually read in the materials we've got, uh, we're going to talk about the issue here for a certain private letter ruling. But the private letter ruling in question is in many ways not unique. I have seen private letter rulings on asking the IRS to waive inadvertent S elections for as long as I've been doing some form of the, you know, a, a podcast or writing or doing any of those things. So this goes back over 20 years. I've been following along every Friday as the IRS releases their private letter rulings and certain other guidance for the week. They do that, tend to do that on Friday. I've been reading these things and we get a ton of these particular private letter ruling requests and IRS releases on inadvertent S terminations. The problem is S corporations are inherently a very, very, very fragile entity. I mean, super fragile entity. That's how they work, right? Once you make an S election, you only remain an S corporation for as long as you keep all requirements in line found in Section 1361B of the code. If you violate any of those, if any of those you go out of compliance with, you have a termination. Now, let's get our terms here right. Revocation is when you voluntarily say, I don't want to be an S anymore. And an S corporation can do that and convert right over to a C corp. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about revocations. We're talking about terminations, and terminations uh, generally are accidental. Yes, sometimes you can use them because revocations have some time 
dates, some dates on them, and you, you can't make them happen right away in some cases. But you can always make a but you can always make your S Corp no longer an S Corp, and that could be an immediate termination. So there are a few cases where a termination is not accidental. But probably 98% of all terminations of S status are accidental. In essence, they happen and nobody noticed that they happen. And there are various ways they happen. One way they happen, which is not what today's rulings talk about, is one class of stock. This is a big problem. Uh, if you have more than one class of stock, you are no longer an S corporation. And that occurs as of the date you actually issue stock from different classes as defined for federal tax purposes. This does not look at what your state corporate tax law talks about when it talks about, not corporate tax, I should say, but just corporate law talks about when it talks about classes of stock. For instance, in most states, if you have voting and non-voting stock, that would be considered two classes of stock. But an S corporation actually can have both voting and non-voting stock. And for federal purposes, that will not be more than one class of stock. But here's the big catch. Federal law defines a class of stock as being your S corporation as a single class of stock if every share of stock or the equivalent of a share of stock, because I know some of you are going to say, wait, we have an LLC, it's elected S, it doesn't issue stock, so this doesn't count, right? That still counts. You're going to come up with some ownership unit, and you have to show that for each unit, the owners, based on the number of units they own, have the same rights as to any distributions currently made, so any current distributions or any distributions in liquidation. So essentially, now you can't say all distributions because if there's an actual stock redemption, that's different because that's allowed. An S-Corp can redeem stock. So it's not every type of distribution, but it is the vast majority of them aside from redemptions. And the real key here is not just doing one, that is disproportionate, where you do a different, where somebody, let's say, you got two 50-50 S-Corp shareholders, but you give 15000 to one during the years of distribution and 10000 to the other. That actually is not, has been ruled effectively, not to be an actual terminating event if state law says that each one had to get 15 and you don't make any sort of agreement to not pay the extra five. In essence, as long as there is a binding legal commitment to get those two straightened out and no agreement not to do it, you haven't really blown it. However, in the contrary, if you have, take an example from private letter ruling a number of years ago, where a company had apparently gone, they wanted to do voting and non-voting stock, their, you know, their, their corporate paperwork their bylaws, their you know corporate documents, none of them said that they could have two classes of stock, voting and non-voting. So the attorney got the boilerplate language out, amended the documents, and so they could have boiler they could have voting and non-voting stock. Unfortunately, in the boilerplate provision that was added, it allowed the board of directors of the corporation, and generally remember, board of directors are part of corporate governance, even if it's a one-person corporation, we still have these different orders, the board, the shareholders, the board, and the officers, and they each have different positions they fill. But the board had the right to declare the dividend separately for voting and non-voting. That was a problem. Even though the corporation had never actually done so, when they issued the non-voting stock, they terminated their S-election and had to go through the process we'll talk about here today. But one of the biggest ways we see problems are you get a non-qualified shareholder holding shares in your S corporation. Now, how do we end up with this happening? Well, there are a few ways. First thing is generally a non-resident alien will mean you no longer have a valid S election. I say generally now because actually with the change in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you can solve the problem by putting those shares into a grantor trust 
and making and electing small business trust election. Weirdly enough, if you do that, you actually save it. We talked about that a number of years ago when the IRS regulations came out on this. So there is a way to save this one now, although it's one that quite often doesn't get noticed. Again, you've got to know it's going to happen and move and make sure things take events so the shares are never directly held by the non-resident alien. Also, you cannot have a corporate shareholder. The only exception is if the corporation is an S-corp and it owns 100% of your shares, and you make a Q sub election for that corporation that the S Corp owns 100% of, then that's the oddball exception. But otherwise, you cannot have a corporate shareholder and you cannot have a partnership as a shareholder. And we see that one fouled up when people use single member LLCs to hold their S shares. And I guess I guess it's a belt and suspenders theory for some people. The S corporation provides liability protection. The LLC provides liability protection. So two's better than one, I guess, is their theory. But the problem becomes then when that LLC, they decide to maybe I want to start gifting interest. And instead of gifting the shares, they instead say, well, I'll give away 25% of the LLC that owns the S shares. As soon as you do that, you've got a partnership. And even if the partnership opts out of subchapter K, it's still a partnership for these, these purposes. And your S election is terminated. Partnerships cannot own S shares. S corporations can own interest in partnerships, but partnerships cannot own interest in S corporations. They will become C corporations when that happens. Okay. And then the big problem that we have in this ruling is trusts. General rule, trusts are not eligible as shareholders. However, there are a number of exceptions. And those exceptions include, and they're in the article we wrote up here, it would include, that that's in the PDF, a trust, all of which is treated as a grantor trust. It treats 100% owned by one person. So 100% grantor trust. Revocable living trusts, let's talk about, are generally grantor trusts. Actually, sorry, they're revocable. that always meet the grantor trust rules. So if it's a revocable grantor trust, one person, that's always going to be an eligible shareholder. Okay, that qualifies. Secondly, now we get to two trusts that involved decedents. The first one is, let's say you, you're holding your shares in that revocable living trust and you die. That trust, which now ceases to be a grantor trust generally under these rules, because it was formerly a grantor trust, it was allowed to hold DS shares. This, this for tax purposes, successor trust. It's really that same trust going forward that can hold the shares for two years from the date of death. Now, you go beyond two years and they haven't left that trust. We have a problem. We lost our S status. OK, we got to unless a couple of things happen, which we'll talk about here in a second. Third, if you have somebody who, let's say, has a trust that is established by their will and they move the shares there. In that scenario, two years from the date, those shares are moved into that trust established by the estate. Regardless of the terms of the trust, your trust, it's still a valid S election. But again, one day past the two years and you've lost your S election generally. Uh, you can have a trust that is a voting trust. It was formed primarily to exercise the voting power, but does nothing else. And then there are two special categories of trust. Now, grantor trust is probably the one I see most often. We've already talked about that. That could hold these shares because quite often grantor trusts are used as estate planning vehicles in states where uh, council believes the smartest thing to do is avoid the state's probate system. And that may or may not make sense. It, it really does depend on the state. And you're going to have to talk to counsel about when that makes sense, when it doesn't. It's not nearly as simple as some uh, people doing turnkey living trust programs might suggest it is. But nevertheless, we see it quite often here in Arizona that they use them. Um, that's the most often one I work with. But there are two others. You can have what is called a qualified subchapter, or basically an electing small business trust, ESBT. 
ESBT trusts are have to comply with certain special rules, which we're not going to worry about here today. But there, the trustee must elect for the trust to be an ESBT, and it must be a trust that meets the requirements to be an ESBT, but it still must be elected. The other one is a qualified subchapter S, subchapter S trust QSST. And in that case, if you have that type of trust that has the terms in it that are necessary to meet those rules and the beneficiary elects, then the beneficiary is treated effectively as owning the shares. Any other form of trust will fail. So if you just have a standard trust, you know, the trust document says, when I die, it goes into trust and the amounts will be held in trust uh, for my kids, but no distribution shall be made except as the trustee feels it is necessary to do so. We don't have any other special terms. After two years, you will not have an S corporation. The shares have to get out of there and either into one of these special trusts, the ESBT or the QSST, or the trust has to satisfy that requirement, right? Or we need to get them in the hands of the individual directly. And normally there are non-tax reasons why we don't want them in the hands of the individual directly. So that's our issue today. Now, as I say, S-Corps are insanely fragile. In fact, a quip I've heard quite often from a couple of places, I would give some credit here, but I've heard it multiple times for multiple people and each one credits somebody else. So I'm just going to say this one I've heard quite often. It's a quip used by people, especially those who do a lot of work with due diligence uh, related to looking at an S corporation that their client is thinking of acquiring, right? And that is there are no actual multiple corporation, multiple owner S corporations in existence, they just flat out don't exist. Rather, there are a large number of C corporations that erroneously believe they are S corporations. Why? Because over time, especially a multi-owner S corporation tends to violate one or more of the rules that are required to maintain your S status. Now, one of the other ways to lose that I didn't mention, and there are more than just this, but let's talk about one of the others. One of the other ways to lose it is if you have a C corporation with earnings and profits that elects S status, and it has three consecutive years where it has excess passive income, which of course, to confuse matters the way Congress works, does not mean passive under the 469 passive loss rules, but rather means a more, a, a basically, a passive under rules like we had for prior to the 86 Tax Act, right? Like dividends, interest, all things that aren't passive under the 469 rules. If you have excess passive income for more than three years, while you pay an extra tax on excess passive income each year, um, if you have earnings and profits from C years, do that three straight years and you lose your S status as of the beginning of year four. That's the other way we see this blown regularly. Okay, well, so what goes on with this? Well, let's talk about Private Letter Ruling 2022-18004. But as I say, this is just one of many. It has a couple of unique quirks, but it's also not all that different. We've seen this happen before. This is the problem that crops up on the death of a shareholder. Shareholder dies. Now, the shareholder's estate is a allowed S-Corp shareholder. That's not a problem. But remember, estates tend to, you know, distribute out the assets. They're not meant to hang around forever, right? And generally, you're going to get in trouble if you try to keep them around forever for tax purposes. So usually you've got to, you know, you kill them off in a couple of years and this goes to something else. Well, quite often, estate plans will decide that, hey, we're going to transfer assets to trust. And that initial trust that we transfer to from a will, or maybe that administrative trust that used to be the grantor trust, that can hold it for two years. But at the end of two years, you got to do something, right? We got to get up on this. And that two-year rule becomes a problem. And I actually think the existence of the two-year rule in many ways leads to the problem because by two years after the death, people may have forgotten that there was anything they were supposed to do or they never noticed it. 
Now, you know, here we're going to talk about a plan, and this was actually an estate plan that was designed to save the status of the S corporation. It had all the right terms in place to preserve the S corp status. However, the trustees either didn't read the document, didn't understand the document, or just didn't care. I mean, I don't know what, but quite often we have trustees end up having to execute this stuff that are, let, let's say, you know, the a child of the decedent, a friend of the decedent, you know, not professional trustees doing this. And quite often they get very concerned about, oh, these legal fees are so expensive and these accounting fees that they start pulling away and not necessarily bringing in or continuing to consult the uh, professionals that were involved in the estate plan, nor consult other professionals who are knowledgeable. You know, they, they might go ahead and get a 1041 done, but they're going to get the 1041 done by, you know, lowest bidder, somebody who just does it. And what becomes even worse, quite a few tax preparers who claim to do trust work are perfectly willing to do trust work and never have read the trust document and don't really know much, let's say, about S-Corp rules. So now we get in trouble. And this is what regularly creates our issue. Now, in this case, they didn't follow the rules. We're going to have a problem. And by the time they discover they have got a problem, the corporation is getting ready to go out of existence via a reorganization. So we have a lot of things coming into play in this case. Now, Right. You know, they, they, they did really, uh, you know, get their relief, as we'll discuss here. Um, and we'll talk about what happens. Let's talk about this actual ruling, what the problem was. OK, it was held in a revocable living trust. And the shareholder died. Now, realize this could be one shareholder out of 20. Okay. The important point to note is when this problem crops up, it doesn't just keep the damage to the, you know, to that trust and the portion of the S-Corp the trust owns. It's going to wipe out S-status for the other 19, some of whom may not even know anybody died, right? And certainly, you know, are probably going to be told it's none of their business if they try to go digging into the detailed operations of the estate of an unrelated party. So it can be very difficult to work with this. The estate plan provided that, you know, the, the shares were to go into a new success or were to go into trust. And then the S Corp shares were then to be taken out of this first trust. And there was going to be a new trust established, which would qualify as a qualified subchapter S trust. And the shares were to be put into that trust, which only held S shares, it was a QSST. And the beneficiaries were to make the QSST election. And presumably, I would suspect that this had some language that caused problems if the beneficiaries did not agree to the QSST election, uh, sort of to incentivize them like your sister's going to get it, get all your shares unless you agree to this. So you probably want to agree to it. Uh, you know, well, whatever, that sort of thing. But the trust, the document clearly had this under control. However, for whatever reason, and again, this is a PLR, we don't get this sort of detail out of it. But for whatever reason, they didn't actually do this. And the IRS, in many of these cases, doesn't seem to worry too much about why it wasn't done. It just wasn't done. However, they continue to treat this thing like it was an escort. And I wouldn't doubt, especially if you have somebody who doesn't do a whole lot of 1041s and believes every trust is a simple trust, and that distribution of income means distribute taxable income, which none of that is true, but let, let's not worry about that, uh, that they very well may have had these people paying tax on the beneficiaries who should have been QSST beneficiaries, may very well have been paying tax on every dollar of S corporation income, just like they normally would, except the, the shares were sitting in that other trust and they continued to sit there. Okay. Eventually, this is discovered. And when it's discovered, as I said, it's discovered right at the time that the corporation is getting ready to basically go out of existence and cease to be a corporation. 
through some form of reorganization. We're not told what type. I will note it doesn't say it was tax-free reorganization. So it could have been a structure, let's say, like reorganizing. Let's say that this S corporation was really an LLC. Or you can, like, merge, cor merge a corp into LLCs. And an LLC is going to be taxed as a partnership. So it could have been a thing that would trigger a liquidation. Now, if that was the case, it would been a really bad result. Because the liquidation would be a double tax scenario, right? Remember, because you would have a, if you have a liquidation of the S-Corp, then we would have a gain inside the S-Corp. And if it's not an S-Corp, it's a C-Corp, then the corporation would pay tax on that gain. And then it would distribute that income or that, you know, the, whatever is left over be deemed distribute those assets to the shareholders pro rata and the shareholders would then have to take the fair market value of what they received and compare that to their basis and if it wasn't an s they wouldn't get to increase their basis by the gain inside the c corp therefore nailing them with the double tax which is the reason why uh c corps aren't terribly well favored these days to uh take care of a lot of issues Right. You know, they don't like that double tax, especially on liquidation. That's a big problem. So they had to go to the IRS and ask them, could they treat this as inadvertent? And the IRS, as they most often do, grant relief. It's very rare that I've, you know, I, I haven't heard of any real cases where the IRS has failed to grant it. Uh, so that's not really an issue. They got it. But the problem is to get this ruling you have to go to the IRS and get a private letter ruling. And that involves paying, paying a user fee and paying a professional to walk this thing through, which is what they had to do. Now, some of you may say, hey, wait, wait, come on. Let's, let's be practical here, right? The IRS never really qualifies an S-Corp. I can just hear somebody right now saying, hey, wait, I've been in practice 30 years and I have done S corporations ever since then, you know, 30 years, ever since the 82 S Corp Act, or maybe the a Tax Reform Act of 86. That was really when they picked up. And I've been doing them, all of my clients, I, I pushed them all into S status. We can talk about the potential problems with that, but that's a whole nother long discussion. In any event, they're all in S's, they've been there. I've never worried about any of this. I've never seen an IRS agent. You know, I've only had a few exams where they examined the S-Corp, and I've never seen an agent look at this. This is crazy. This doesn't matter. We can ignore it. That can be, you can be totally true about the fact the IRS does not very often terminate S status. I'm sure they have done it, but not, but it doesn't happen very often. And I'll agree with you there, but that doesn't mean you should worry about that because here's the catch. The real issue here is not the IRS. Why are all these PLRs being issued for something that the IRS never make, makes, a, makes an issue out of on exam? Why this one? There's a whole bunch of other things that, you know, the IRS may rarely raise on exam and we don't see people go to get private letter rulings you know, to try to insulate themselves from the IRS doing it on exam and killing these things off. We just don't see many of those, right? So why this one? Well, the reason is pretty easy. These tend to be driven quite often by a due diligence review being undertaken by an accounting firm. And there are departments in the big four that specialize in this. There are any national firm will have people that do this, right? Their client is looking at potentially buying, acquiring the assets or the stock. In many cases, it could be the stock, you know, if they're trying to entice the buyer by offering a tax beneficial structure. So they're going to take over this corporation, right? Microsoft wants to get a foot in the door in some market. Uh, wasn't probably the issue here. Uh, because I don't know what structure Beats had. I don't recall. I don't think they were public. But you remember, it was Do Dr. Dre and Eddie Iovine owned Beats, who was known for headphones. But Apple acquired them. It wasn't really for the headphones. Apple acquired them because they were a company that had a contract with the record industry. 
to run a streaming service and license their music and pay it on a monthly fee on a subscription like Spotify and the uh, various other ones do. Well, Apple was in a position of they had bet they had bet against streaming early on. In fact, famously, Steve Jobs more than once had said that people want to own music, not rent it. Okay, turns out that didn't hold up over time. Um, and the problem became when Apple finally decided we need to get in this rental music business because Spotify is is becoming too big and it's wiping out our music sales business. The music industry didn't trust Apple terribly, shall we say. And it would have negotiated very tough with Apple and probably would not have gotten a deal anything like what Spotify, etc., had gotten. At least that was their perception. So by acquiring Beats, they got basically these contracts in place by acquiring that company. Now, let's assume that Beats was an S-Corp, which I'm pretty sure it wasn't, but let's assume it was. And you had the, these two owners, Do Dr. Dre and Eddie Iovine. So the two owners we've got. As I recall, it was like $3 billion they got paid. Okay, great. Apple buys it for these for big bucks. But it turns out, let's say, if it was an S-Corp, that there would be a firm go in and do a d due diligence review. Now they discovered there's a flaw and Beats was not a valid S-Corporation. Well, you know, they, they come back and say, look, you're not a valid S-Corp. You need to fix this to get a PLR. You know, Dr. Dre and Eddie Iovine decide to play hardball. Okay, let's say they do that. Well, the problem is, since they're mainly interested in the contracts, there were other companies out there that were also trying to get into this whole streaming music business that had a very similar contract. So it wasn't as if, you know, they, they couldn't go grab somebody else. And that's where your client ends up. So now the problem is we need to fix this problem. So there's no concern about whether the assets were tainted because, you know, they, they, should, have, they should have been used to pay the taxes in the past. There's no problem if you take over the corporation, took over the liability for all those unpaid taxes during the C years when they never filed returns. So these companies want this fixed. And the real problem for us as, you know, outside CPAs is that, uh, you know, when these are done, somebody's got to pay the user fee and somebody's got to pay for walking it through the uh, process. And let's be honest, these consulting firms, you know, these, these let's say the big four, the national firm, they're going to suggest that they take care of filing for the PLR. And they're going to have a persuasive case in two very important ways. Number one, they're going to say you don't want to use this CPA who didn't even notice the problem, even though they've been doing the returns for 15 years. They didn't even notice you had this huge problem that stood out like a sore thumb five minutes into our review. So that's bad. That, that probably goes against the CPA. But secondly, they'll say, and we've done a ton of these. So we do them all the time. We're good at doing it. We get them done. We can guarantee you this is going to go through. And they're going to say, and because, you know, it's really not your fault. Your CPA or your attorney should have noticed this or both. Um, we're pretty sure that if you file a claim with their insurance carrier, that their insurance carrier or they are going to end up paying this fee. Right. Very persuasive case to the client. If they do this, it goes through. They don't lose anything out of pocket. And they don't feel that bad for you because you fouled up. Right. In essence, they only have this problem because you didn't notice something that these other CPAs noticed in a few minutes. How could you miss it? That's why these are important. So make sure you think about whenever you do an S-Corp return. Try to consider, is there any reason why this thing is no longer an S-Corp? And at least get ahead of the game in this area, you know, and especially with new clients you take on. Remember, until you've actually done the return, you now can actually raise the issue. And you can tell them that you're not an S-Corp because you have ineligible shareholders. Um, you can't fix this without going to the IRS because that's the other problem. The law makes it very clear the IRS has to grant this relief. 
And in this case, because they had to reform the trust, there's even another problem. IRS ruled years ago that reforming a trust that failed to meet the S requirements to retroactively reform it, uh, you, you can't do retroactively. It's only prospectively after the date the court reforms it does it count as an S shareholder. So you needed IRS relief for two very simple reasons. Now, as I said, would the IRS ever have disqualified you? Probably not. You know, in, in essence, that's also the reason why they feel so comfortable asking for these rulings, because they, they know they're going to get it. But you are really set up if they ever sell the company. And once you let this pass, because I know it's in the tax season, the client's whining, where is the return? You just want to get it out the door so you don't worry about this. Once you've let that first return go out, you're, you, you, you just basically took the problem off the hand of the first CPA, maybe not entirely, but pretty much, and you've now taken down that problem as your own because you're now the CPA that should have noticed the problem. It's a continuing problem you should have noticed. That's where the issue comes. Finally, let's look at a case here of Del Ponte versus Commissioner, 158 TC number 7, issued on May the 5th. This is an innocent spouse case, and it's really interesting. It, it's kind of an obscure point, but it's somewhat important. And let's us look at how innocent spouse cases are handled administratively. And the issue comes as to whether, you know, if the first time the issue is raised where a spouse asks for instant spouse relief is in a deficiency case in front of the tax court. So I've already gone through the exam. I've already gone through the 90-day letter. We have now gone to tax court, right? We're now in tax court, and we raise the case, raise the issue. Does the IRS have to pay attention to, or does the chief counsel's office have to pay attention to uh, what the Cincinnati centralized innocent spouse operation uh, decides should be done about this case or not? That's the key. Now, the Cincinnati Centralized Innocent Spouse Operation, or CCISO, this generally administrate from in most cases is the entity that where the IRS centralized making the decision about whether or not to grant innocent spouse relief. And it applies in two cases. If you, you know, you will go there first to make the determination, which will be binding on the service for the most part, um, you know, it applies if before there has been, you know, before we're in tax court, if the spouse, as soon as they become aware of the problem, files for instance spouse relief, it goes to this office. And when it goes to this office, if this office, you jump through all the hoops, there's a whole ton of them to jump through to qualify. But if this office determines that you qualify, then the IRS is bound to grant you the innocent spouse relief because they wanted to have a centralized point to make these decisions rather than having every single agent in the country being involved in making these calls. So we have this. Now, the problem is the rules that we're going to see in uh, chief counsel advice and also in the Internal Revenue Manual, they don't really specify exactly how this works when the issue is not raised until we're before the tax court with a deficiency procedure. Now, you might wonder, well, how did this get there? Why didn't, why didn't in this case, you know, Ms. Del Ponte raise the issue prior to it going to tax court because, you know, she could have gotten out of their office? Well, the problem was, and her ex isn't quite as bad as this might sound initially, um, but he kind of kept her in the dark about the fact there was a potential multi-million dollar tax assessment coming against their joint returns. I, it's a minor detail. I'm, I'm sure, sure my former spouse would never care about that. Uh, we're way past the time period where the IRS would go after those returns, aside from showing a fraud. Said, so, nope, don't, don't have that, so, so we're good. But, you know, it'd be one of those things like, yeah, I'm pretty sure if it was $500, my former spouse, if we had an issue come up of that sort, she would have, and actually totally justified, 
have been wanting to know that was happening. There was this potential issue in play and be kept informed about it and probably get her own counsel. Uh, because, look, I'm a CPA. And let's be honest, there's this innocent spouse option. And if she gets into spouse treatment, then I'm the one who's going to be writing the checks 100%. If she doesn't, there's joint and several liability. So I have somewhat of a conflict of interest representing my ex on an innocent spouse routine where I'm the guilty spouse. Okay. So this sounds bad that he kept her in the dark. But what he did, he continually asserted the innocent spouse claim. He didn't ask her about it. He just did it. Now, why this was happening was because th this was an attorney who had been selling tax shelters, had been, you know, in the business of selling tax shelters, made a lot of money off doing so. And he did eat his own dog food. Uh, you know, he basically used his own shelters, you know, the shelter types he had sold to others. He was using that to shelter his own income. So, you know, he I mean, you know, if it's well, it turns out the court decided eventually it didn't work, but at least he wasn't somebody who was, you know, not it was telling you to do something he wasn't willing to do. So, okay. And he was trying to get his ex-spouse off the hook. My guess is part of that was because he's okay, he's not a total jerk, let's say. But part of it is because he probably didn't want to talk to the ex and he would just assume this all got solved without the ex getting involved. But nevertheless, the problem is the tax court, of course, doesn't like this whole fact. Right. When there's innocent spouse, um, they're going to kind of demand there be separate counsel. You know, who's who's representing the spouse? And that question kind of then becomes a problem. The tax court divides us into two cases. Right. The innocent spouse case, the others somewhere just before that happened, she became aware of this case, this potential multimillion dollar liability. And she got her own counsel. Now, she went ahead and ratified her, at least her counsel told her, I assume, to ratify, you know, his applications for innocent spouse status, you know, in front of the court. So she went ahead and say, yeah, that's our position, that regardless of whether he whether there's liability or not for this, you know, taxes from his tax shelter years. Uh, we should qualify for innocent spouse relief. And so I don't own anything. That would be Ms. Del Ponte. Del Ponte says, I don't owe anything. Okay. That, that, that was the structure. Okay. That's it. So she ratified those prior filings, right? And we have the separate court. Now, per a chief counsel advice discussed in our materials, it advises when the, when counsel, IRS counsel, right, under the chief counsel's office. So it'll always, it'll always talk and it's as itself, right? The chief counsel's office is to ask for advice from the centralized office, the Cincinnati Centralized Innocent Spouse Operations Office. Now, note it says ask for advice. Right? If you're a taxpayer, you ask for determination from them. And that binds the IRS. But they ask for advice. The Cincinnati office looked at the facts, got the information from her that we normally get, for instance, spouse. And they, they came back and said, well, you know, we're, when we look at this, we would say that she qualifies for instance, spouse relief. However, while, the, while they did that and re sent that recommendation to counsel, counsel said, you know what? I understand that you recommend that based on what you provided, but I think we need more information. So he contacted her, her, her and her counsel, and said, here's it is. The, the Cincinnati office did come to a conclusion and recommend to us, because he needs to disclose this fact, that you be offered innocent spouse relief. But, you know, we at the counsel's office uh, believe that, in fact, more information is necessary before we would approve the grant of that. And we want to now go into informal discovery. Now, she, of course, says, wait, no, you've got no option but to grant relief. Because she says the IRS has granted full administrative decision rights to the CCISO. So when they came back and said, yes, she meets all the criteria 
in a case, and so in this case, we would, if it was earlier, we would have made the determination that she qualifies. You, chief counsel, have no right to override that. So we, as a matter of law, have a right to the innocent spouse, and I'm off the hook. Okay. Her counsel and her took that position. Unfortunately for them, the tax court did not agree. Now, what she did was effectively, and the court decided, well, this is effectively a motion, right, to kind of get summary judgment, right? That, that's it. There, there's no factual issue left to be decided. Uh, you know, the chief counsel just has to do this. And the tax court said, well, here's the catch. Code section 7803 grants decision-making responsibility to the chief counsel on any matter before the courts when they represent the IRS. They're totally in charge of this at that point. And they point out that is exactly the same section that gives the commissioner the right to basically des you know, to designate others to make certain decisions, to decide which part of his office he can delegate that so he doesn't make the decision. See, Treasury delegates to the commissioner, and then the commissioner delegates to these other parties to make decisions that are binding. So the binding decision authority from, tre from the regulations to Treasury through to the commissioner's office goes to those they designate. But here's the problem. The code says that the chief counsel's office has total control here. And while they have the right to delegate, they can only delegate to members of the chief counsel's office, that's ruling there. They said, so one problem you've got is that while the commissioner may have designated this CCISO office as the office that is to make this decision, uh, that's only for things under the commissioner's control. This is not. The code says council has the right to do it. This office is not part of the council's office, so they couldn't delegate to them. They can't get out of it. They're the ones that have to make the decision. The other thing they point out was this particular chief council advice. They said it's important to note the words here. It does tell council that if they have an instant spouse issue come up, they, they should, right, that they are to, you know, coordinate with CCISO, so they're supposed to move over to CCISO. CCISO is then to give their advice, and it says that the council should follow the recommendation. However, the court note, it says should, not must. And the court said that's really important to note because other places for other situations, the advice memorandum says they must do certain things. They said, so they're saying, look, the chief counsel's office knows that they can say must. Must could be there. And that wouldn't be a delegation. In essence, the court says even though they can't delegate to CCISO, the government is required to follow its formal procedures. And so if the procedure required them to follow this guidance, then they'd have to do so. But the, the procedure doesn't. They said it uses must in other parts of it. If this was a must clause, we'd agree with you. They have to do it. But because this is not a must clause here or in the Internal Revenue Manual, it's a should clause. Uh, should doesn't count. The fact they should do something does not mean they have to. That's there. And the other issue was, in a chief counsel advice issued after this decision was rendered, where the council said, nope, we're not going to follow it. It then later clarified and again made it very clear. And this time when it said they should follow the recommendation, they said, except in unusual circumstances. And the court said, well, that, that further indicates that that should was not accidental, that that line says should, and it still says should. And the other parts now say still say must that that was not accidental when they revised it slightly for another issue. So they're saying, yeah. So as a matter of law, the decision is to be made by the chief counsel's office, and counsel does not have to always follow the recommendation of the CCISO. And that's true, even though we know the CCISO, 
would have said grant you the relief. And even though we know that you never got a chance to apply for relief before it went to tax court, at which point then the CCISO determination would have bound the IRS on the administrative side and you would have gotten your relief. We know that it's tough, you know, that that's it. The reality is that's just how this works. It may not be fair, but it's just mechanically how it works. And they said, and they argued, well, it's not fair. The tax court said, as they often do in cases like this, we are not, a, they didn't use this term, but it's a term, it's a way it gets worded all the time. They just said, we have no power to do so. The line most often used is, we are not a court of equity. We cannot consider equities except when the law specifically allows for it. And this is not a case where the law allows us to apply a principle of equity. That has to be very explicitly drawn out for them to do it. Now, I should point out, this does not mean she's liable. This is still a factual issue, right? It's still a factual issue to decide if she should get relief. This will go before the tax court, right? And the facts would be presented. Now, she may have a problem because she refused to provide the IRS with any additional facts. So chief counsel will argue why those other facts are important. And, you know, they might want to, she might want to cooperate with them now uh, seeing as at this point, she can always try to fall back on it and say, look, the other office said this should count, you know, and chief counsel now has to establish why it shouldn't. Um, but they're going to be stuck with that problem. But it does not mean she automatically loses. But it does mean that, yeah, you're not going to be able to make use of that option if, for that office if you go to court your chief counsel's office is going to perform, as they said, because one of the way in is with a collection due process hearing, and there the appellate conferee does get to accept or reject this. And they said, look, he's the in this case, the chief counsel is serving the same function as the appellate conferee. Even, and said so it's not really relevant, but that would be the case anyway for why it's not unequal. They said the three systems are all different and it depends upon which way you come in. And, you know, tough luck that your ex did this, but you ratified what he did. So, you know, tough luck. Uh, you're stuck with this, have to go this route. Well, this has been the Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of May the 9th, 2022. Current Federal Tax Developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and your state societies. I do monitor the uh, discussion boards at the Arizona Society Connect site, New Jersey Society's Connect site. The Connect site for Illinois and Minnesota, and Washington, and also any posts to go up on Idaho's discussion board. Uh, join us back here next week when we'll talk about other things happening. Those of you who do a lot of not-for-profit organizations, yeah, hey, you got a fun deadline coming. You're probably not going to be listening next week until after the Monday. But, hey, we'll look at it. That, that's the first deadline for you. But we'll look at that go forward. So, Hopefully you have a good week. Hopefully you, uh, you know, if you're in the not-for-profit world, you get all those either out the door or extended. And for the rest of you, hopefully you're enjoying your spring. We're heading to summer, and in Phoenix we're heading to 107 next week, so we're definitely heading to summer. Uh, but in any event, we will see you here back next week with more current federal tax developments. <laughs>